Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and spending part of your evening with us. Um, we hope that you will find some very, uh, some very useful information this evening. When you came in, you were given a sheet of paper that is a feedback form and also a card with a pencil. So um, as we go through this evening's presentation, what we would like to ask for you to do is to please jot down questions as they come to you. And then if you will just hold up your hand, we will collect the cards. Um, and as time allows, we will address your questions at the end of the session. Uh, for the if we run out of time, even if we don't run out of time and are able to address all your questions, we will be collecting the questions uh, in the card format. We will answer them and we will be posting all of that information online and that should be up by the middle of next week at the latest. Additionally, you've got the feedback form and the feedback form is two-sided. So if you are staying only for the elementary to junior high transition meeting, um, just complete that side. We welcome you certainly to stay for the Understanding High School credits uh, portion of this evening's presentation, and uh, and that one is on the on the opposite side of the page. Additionally, the slides that we are showing this evening will be available online after tonight's presentation. Again, uh, everything should be up and up and going by midweek next week. Okay. So uh, to begin right now, I would like to introduce our panel of experts on the subject of transition from elementary to junior high. That is Susan Covington, school counselor at Nottingham Country Elementary and district lead counselor. Alejandra Pais at Memorial Parkway Elementary and uh, at Memorial Parkway Elementary. We've got Jody Darcy, who is at Wood Creek Junior High and I'm sorry, Jody Slaughter, <laughs> at Wood Creek Junior High, and she is also a district lead counselor. Janie Bazargani at Morton Ranch Junior High, and Brianna Pollinger at Kilpatrick Elementary. So without further ado, I will let these ladies let you know some wonderful things about transition. I am so excited to be here with you at the Legacy Academy tonight. When I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking, wow, I wish they would have had something like this when my students were going to junior high because I think it would have been really helpful. So thank you for being here. If you have a student that will be entering sixth grade in the fall, raise your hand. Okay. Are there any parents that have younger children that'll be going to junior high later on? Okay, great. Are there any students that are gonna be entering junior high? Welcome. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to speak to you um, as we go along. When we decided about what to include in the presentation, we kept in mind what students often has, have as concerns, but the good news is that your students are primed for this transition, they're ready for going on to sixth grade. Developmentally, they have characteristics. They're curious, they're motivated by challenge, they are capable of complex thinking, and they wanna make the world a better place. So the junior high will be ready for them too. If your child gets anxious or stressed, there are some things you can do to help smooth that transition. I'll give you four C's. The first one is be a calm parent. You are the model for your child, and so it's really important that even though you might be freaking out inside, <laughs> you put up a calm front for your child because they're looking out to you. But create excitement about the transition because there are a lot of awesome things that happen in junior high, and you can build that anticipation with your child. Be ready to have conversations. Whenever they have worries that pop up, talk to them, ask them what they're thinking, and try to help them work through a plan for how to address those concerns. And come to the junior high. We're gonna be talking about opportunities for you to visit the junior high later on in the presentation. So as you know, Pretty, uh, not too long from now, we'll have a course selection and your students will be signing up for several classes. 
they will have seven or eight teachers and the length of the class is much shorter than what they have now. When they, well, this causes like a little change in the relationship between teachers and students. Right now, they're probably really close with their teachers. They know their teachers really well. In junior high, it takes a longer amount of time for that relationship to become, build that rapport because they don't have as much time together. So also remind them the same for their classmates. They'll have a potential different mix of students in every class. So it may take a little bit more time for them to get to know their classmates and their teacher. In elementary, the students are closely supervised. The teachers walk them to lunch, walk them to recess, walk them to the library. And in junior high, they go independently. This graphic can help us see how a balance is created between responsibility and freedom. They have to build up their responsibility to maintain their level of freedom to Im improve their independence. Developmentally, they have a need to move and for physical activity. So switching classes every 45 minutes is actually a positive thing. And they also have PE 45 minutes every day. So that's another positive. Another thing about PE is sometimes students are a little nervous about dressing out for PE. I found some great tips for you guys. So quick changes reduce the amount of time that you might be embarrassed. So practicing, make sure you wear clothes that are easy to change into and out of when you're dressing out. Organizing so that you have your shirt on top, you can change that real, change that real quick, and uh, so on. Also, they might be a little worried about their body because bodies are changing. Everybody's so different in junior high. But I want to remind you that everyone is in the same boat in the locker room, and everyone is worrying about themselves. You're think they're, everyone is thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about other people. So just remember that. Nobody's thinking about you. Everybody's worried about their own selves. Also, try to build up a positive body image with your child. My son was very thin when he was younger. He still is. But that was a struggle for him. And we had to remind him that even though he was very thin, that he was strong. He was fast. So remind your child about all the positive things that about their body so they can build up that positive body image. And there's a time limit, so remind them about saving conversation for later. If someone tries to talk to them, they can say, hey, let me change real quick and then we'll chat. Lunch has got a lot more choices in junior high. The seating is different. In elementary, they all sit together at the same table. In junior high, they have lots of choices about where they can sit. In elementary, there's one lunch line. In junior high, there are three. So there's a lot of novelty involved with lunch in junior high. I encourage you to go to the web and check out the lunch menus. Have your child look at the different options and kind of make some plans about what they want to do for lunch. The lines might be a little bit longer at the beginning of the year because of the novelty, but that will wear off and things will be, you know, it'll be easier to get through a line. They also might want to plan about who they're going to have lunch with. They might have lunch with a friend that they're in the class with before lunch, or they might make arrangements with a friend to meet somewhere so that they can find a seat together uh, at lunchtime. So fine arts, the classes meet every day. And I told you that we were going to talk about opportunities to visit the junior high. Well, visiting fine arts programs at this time of year, November, December, there's lots of programs going on. If your child is not sure about what elective they want to try, 
you can look on, this is so, I was so excited when I found this. If you go to a secondary campus page, look for quick links, and there's a calendar tab. In the calendar tab, there's KISD Fine Arts Calendar. It has all the events from every school in the district on that calendar. You can find the junior high that your child will, child will be attending and investigate some of the programs that they might want to see, and that'll give you a chance to go visit the junior high. The more they're there, the more comfortable they'll be. Fine Arts is another place to build up friendships because there's that common interest. And I know sometimes Fine Arts groups sit together at lunchtime too. So making friends is another developmental need. The students need to have a feeling of belonging and fitting in. So that social piece is, a, is an important part of school. You know, we talked about how in elementary school, the class is together. The same students are together all day long. So they generally make friends with the kids in their class. And they're in class with their friends all day. They have lunch with their friends. They play at recess with their friends. Same people. Junior high friendships change a lot because they're not with the same people all day. So they begin to broaden their circle of friends. It's important that children know if they're not included in every outing, it's not because someone is mad at them or someone doesn't like them anymore. It's just that you might be with different friends in different activities. So you might sit with some friends at lunch because you're in the class with them before lunchtime. Or you might stay after school and hang out with somebody because you're in some special activity together. On the weekend, you might hang out with different people. So also remind them to choose people that make them feel good about themselves. If someone's cutting them down, this is a great opportunity for them to find other friendships. They don't have to maintain a friendship if it's not good for them. Another thing that can be helpful is social skills. Practicing the art of conversation, adding relevant comments, asking questions, listening. Practice some awkward situations, things that you think might come up, difficult situations. Remind them to stay calm and reserve judgment or um, actions that they might regret later. And help them come up with some kind of line they can use like, let me think about that. And then they, that gives them an out, and they can come back and talk to that person another time. Thank you so much. And again, if you have any questions, remember to write them down on your card. Good evening, everybody. Thank you again for being here. Um, I'm going to talk with you now about the academic part of the uh, difference between elementary and junior high. I'm going to start from the bottom. Uh, we're going to talk first about the grading and how the, the grades are weighed in elementary and in junior high. As you can see over here, uh, in elementary school, the other grades are uh, the weight is 10% of the total grade of your students, of your children. That 10% includes homework. Participation counts right now in elementary. The effort that they put in completing their work, even if it is not all the way done, the effort that they put in counts for, the, for that 10% of the grade. Uh, the process, all that type of thing, right now is counting in elementary. In junior high, it's going to be a little bit different. The homework is going to be... Uh, they're going to have more homework than they do have right now, okay? And uh, it, it weights 15% now instead of 10%. They're going to have more homework. It's going to be a little bit more lengthy, so they're going to have to put some effort into that homework, and uh, they need to turn it in, and they need to be responsible for turning in that homework. It's not like in elementary. When they have homework, the teacher will be saying in the morning or when they come to that class, okay, what is your homework? Come, come here, put it here, give it to me. Teacher is going to check a roster, and he's going to say, okay, so-and-so, or you haven't bring me your homework, please bring it to me. 
in junior high, the kids, like Susan said, are going to be a little bit more independent, a little bit, no, a lot more independent. And the teacher is going to give the instructions, and they're going to say something like, this basket over here is the basket for homework. When you walk in my classroom, you put your homework over there. If you didn't turn it in, that's the student responsibility. It's not the teacher responsibility to ask the, the students anymore to go ahead, open your backpack, your folder, put your homework away. That's going to be completely different now. So they need to be responsible for all that. And it's now 15% of the grade, not 10%. So be aware of that. Uh, in the minor category, minor grades in elementary counts for 50% of the grades. So half of it is just minor. Uh, minor grades are pretty much the same. The quizzes, the classwork, the projects that they complete at home, not in the classroom necessarily. They can start a project in the classroom, but they can take it home. That counts for a minor grade. But now we're going to have 40% of that grade only in junior high. So they need to work on the quizzes. They need to get good classwork. They need to get good grades. To, comp to, to go to that 40%. In elementary, it's a little bit easier. It's very coached with the, the, the students are very coached by the, by the teachers, and it counts for 50. Now it's going to be 40. We're going to go down 10% 10, 10 on that minor grade. The major grades instead is going to be from 40% in elementary school to 45% in junior high. That will count for the, all the tests, the in-class projects, the formal assessment that the district has is developed by teachers, by district. So all the formal assessment that they're going to be having and uh, all, the all the major tests that they're going to have are going to be part of the major grade. So major grade goes from 40 to 45%. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you about grade reporting. The grades, uh, the first difference, the, the, the main difference that we, you're going to encounter when you go to junior high is that we go in elementary from nine grade periods. That's when you receive your report card and your progress report in the middle to six grade grading periods. So you're going to have a grading period every six weeks. And every three weeks, you're going to get the progress report. Another difference with the report cards is that um, you're not going to have, okay, you're going to get the report cards. Your student is going to have, that depends also on the schools. The student is going to receive the progress report. is going to take it home. It's up to the student, really, to give it to you because the junior highs are not going to request the signature. So the students are going to bring the progress report or the report card home. In some cases, the report cards are going to be mailed, depending on the student. You may receive it on the mail. You may receive it with your student. But you don't have to sign and return the report card or the progress report. So pay attention to the grades. Pay attention to the calendar, to the grading periods, when the grades are due, and when the progress report and the report cards are being sent home. Okay, that all that information is going to be on the website, and it is on the website, so you can look it up. Your students are going to have all that information with them. The, all, most of this information is posted on Canvas, which is a program that they're going to be using a lot to do homework that they are using right now in elementary to a certain level. But a lot of the homework and a lot of the uh, projects and things are going to be posted on Canvas, so you need to start getting familiar with that. And uh, report cards, uh, if you want to check grades, and we encourage you to check grades often with your children and get the students to learn how to check their own grades on the Home Access Center. If you don't have access to your, to your student's grade, just go to your school, to your children's school, and ask the registrar, and she will have all the information for you. So you will get access to the Home Access Center. That is the place where you go and check the grades that your students are having. If a teacher doesn't contact you because a student is not passing a class or is having low grades or is missing a lot of assignments, that's most teachers will try to do that. But sometimes we get caught up with a lot of work and do not have the time or the, at the moment to contact the parents. That's why we encourage you 
to be checking the grades at least once a week so you kind of know where your student is. There might be some missing assignments, there might be some incomplete assignments, or there might be uh, some zeros or anything that you can solve before the report card goes home go ahead and start checking the Home Access Center. The students have their username and password, they can check their Home Access Center too, and they can check their grades periodically. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, UIL implications for junior high. Okay, this goes with the eligibility for participate, partic par, sorry, participating in uh, UIL activities. It can be band, it can be orchestra, it can be theater, it can be uh, sports, right? Uh, if a student is not passing one class, it doesn't have to be the whole class, all the classes, all the subjects, just one class that they do not have a passing grade, they lose the eligibility to participate in those extra activities. And until they bring that grade up and they are passing again that class, they will not be able to participate. Um, I can tell, I have seen students that cannot go to a performance. They have been practicing forever, like the, the high school, I have my kids in, in high school band. If they, they practice all summer. They practice all this, all this time. And uh, they go to a competition and they cannot participate if they're failing one class. So all the practice, all the, all, all the work, all the effort, is just becomes a frustration. So they need to be aware of that and you need to be aware of that. There are no exceptions because this is UIL um, requirements. And um, well, we talk about already the parent signature is not always required. It's not required for homework. It's not required for report cards. It's not required for planners. We are using elementary to go to class, and in the beginning of the of, of the class period, we ask the students, okay, open your planner, please fill up the, the copy from the board or copy from uh, the list that I have here, this is what I need to see in your planner. And then as a teacher, I used to walk around my classroom and check, okay, you did, you copy, you copy, and then, okay, everything is fine. The planner goes home and the parents need to sign, meaning the parents read the planner, okay? In junior high, that's not gonna happen. If the student chooses to write in the planner whatever is on the board, fine. If the, if the student chooses not to write anything in the planner, you will have a full blank planner at the end of the year. They are not required. You are not required to sign. And teachers are not required to check that the students are writing in that planner. So encourage your children to be responsible and to find a way to be organized, because that's what they need, organization skills. They are more independent now, and they need a lot of organization skills. If it is a planner, it's a planner, fine. You don't need to sign it. You don't need to, even, you don't even need to see it. So encourage those organization skills on your children. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the course selection process. And if you don't know what course selection is, it's the part where you pick your classes. Um, in secondary, it's something that happens every year. So after you have done it one time, you'll know when to expect it and how important it is. Um, it is a very important process and there's a little bit of paperwork required. And one of the things that I always try to instill in the incoming sixth graders every year when I speak to them is how important the paperwork is because we hold on to it and we reference it and that's how we make your schedule. Um, so the first thing it says here is the timeline and the process. Course selection really for counselors has already started because we begin to plan. And for students starting in January, especially for our incoming sixth graders, they're the first ones that we address, um, but early to mid-January, students start getting information about their classes that they can choose for the upcoming school year. And then it continues on through February and is pretty much over before spring break. 
So when we come back from Christmas holiday all the way till spring break is when the course selection process is taking place. Um, so for a student, it might seem like, wow, that's way ahead of you know the next school year. But um, the important thing to know is that it's really how the whole school, the principal, and everyone plans for the teachers and the classes for the upcoming school year. So it's a really important um, process for the students to take very seriously because their choices are going to be their choices and um, those are the classes that they're going to be in the next year. So a big difference between elementary and junior high or secondary is that students can choose the level of class that they can take. In elementary, um, you don't get to choose your level of class. You're just in the grade level. Um, but in junior high, you have pre-AP classes and you have academic classes. So um, there's a bit of a, a difference there. I think one of the hardest things for parents and students to decide on is how do I know if my student should take a pre-AP class? Typically, counselors will encourage parents to um, like refer to the fifth grade teacher and ask them for their opinion on you know what kind of student is my student? Do you think they would be a good candidate for a pre-AP class? Um, as a counselor, we do encourage that you talk to the fifth grade teacher. And we also, um, we do, KDISD and all of the schools want to encourage students to take the most rigorous classes that they can take. So we want your student to be challenged, which I'm sure you do as well. Um, and typically for... To answer that question, I mean, if your if your student is passing their class with a a higher grade, then they're probably going to be successful in pre-AP. We don't um, not allow students to try pre-AP, no matter what their grade is, because again, we want to teach them how to do that as well. Um, I will say that one of the biggest factors in pre-AP success is just the student being able to manage the class. Like we were just talking about, are you the kind of student that's going to go in, write the assignments down from the board? Are you going to turn your homework in? It's more about class management than it is about the content. Because most, you know, the students can learn. It's just about the independent factor and that the responsibility is on them. So talk to your fifth grade teacher. You can definitely ask your, your school counselor. Um, the elementary counselors are well-seasoned in talking to the fifth grade parents about, you know, how to make that choice. And um, and then you just make a choice and you try it and it's going to be okay because it's only the sixth grade. That's what I say. I'm the sixth grade counselor at my school this year, so trust me, it's okay. We're going to help you and the student. Um, and then electives. So there's going to be a choice of fine arts electives as a sixth grader Every year from sixth grade all the way until graduation, students get more choices in electives. So starting in the sixth grade, you only have the fine arts selectives, and um, they get to choose which one they want to take, and they'll have it every day. It's not like a rotating special type situation like elementary. Then it is important to be aware that your fifth grade star scores could impact your schedule and your classes. Um, students who are not successful on the first administration of the STAR test will be um, provided with intervention during the school day, which means it's going to take the place of their elective and or their PE. And I'll tell you, I believe most of our campuses take into consideration, I mean, a sixth grade student who wants to start with an instrument, for example, band or orchestra. Um, that student's going to be able to do that, you know, even if they need an intervention, we might recommend that they don't take PE for their first year, like they will take the intervention course. And I will say too, there are a bunch of different situations that arise and just don't hesitate to, you know, talk to the counselor at the school, at the junior high, once your student is there, just explain what's going on in your situation. 
And I think it's something that's become more flexible. Um, but the school's responsibility is to help the students be on grade level for the end of the sixth grade at least. And that's important too because like we were talking about UIL eligibility. By the time seventh grade rolls around, you want your student to be passing their classes so that they can participate in UIL activities if they want to. Okay, there are events that you can get more information about course selection. Like I mentioned, um, most junior high, well, all the junior high campuses have a way of delivering the information to the students. All the junior highs host parent night, incoming sixth grade parent night. So um, I encourage you to attend that. For the most part, it's similar, but um, every school is a little bit different and they offer some different classes sometimes. Um, and then the website will also have lots of information. There's something called the course catalog and it's a document that contains anything and everything you're gonna need to know about courses all the way until your student graduates. And students that are coming into the sixth grade will get a copy of that um, or they'll get a link to access it online. And that's a really good document to start reading as your student is entering secondary. It doesn't look very exciting, but the answer to almost any question that you have is in there. Um, so I encourage you to get familiar with it. And then the final thing here is opportunity to make changes. So students, um, we realize it is, you know, it's a big decision to choose your classes. And I mentioned the timeline. So from the moment they get the information in early January, they will have time to fill out their paperwork, turn it in, and then um, there's something called the course verification process. And that's another paper that will be printed out. And basically that says, here's what you chose. Do you want to make any changes? And that is the only opportunity that students have to make changes. Like I mentioned before, the planning for the next school year, um, that all that happens in the spring. So you check your course verification, you like it or you don't, you request a change, and then that's it. There's no worrying about our classes until we get our schedule, and we love it the first time because it's the best. Um, but so nothing happens with classes until the fall whenever the students get their schedule. So that's all I have to say about course selection. I'm gonna pass it over to Miss Janie. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some organizational tips um, to help your kiddo transition into junior high. So next fall, how many of you will be first time junior high parents? Congratulations! Yay! <laughs> so the best advice I can give to you right now is start now. Start now with helping your student get organized and set a routine. Um, Routines going from elementary to junior high, things are going to change a little bit. You're going to have a different start time. Um, drop off and pick up is going to look different. So you've kind of got to figure out what time do you need to leave your house to get to the bus stop and to get to school on time. So I can tell you that, as Ms. Paez said, the planner plays a huge role in your student being successful. So you need to set a routine where you're reviewing the calendar and your student's planner at least once a week, maybe more than once a week starting out. That way they can get used to writing things down in their planner and they can show you, hey, mom, dad, this is what we're doing in class. I have this test on Thursday. I have this test on Friday or I've got a project due on this day. So you can familiarize yourself with kind of, hey, this is what my kiddo's doing at school and hey, I need to email the teacher because my student doesn't understand what the project instructions were. Backpack cleaning out. That's my favorite part. So a lot of times I'll have students come into my office because they're missing assignments and we've got to figure out what's going on. And so we dump their backpack out in the middle of the floor of my office. Y'all, there is stuff growing in their backpack. 
I am not going to lie. So as a parent, it's a great idea to do a weekly backpack clean out. Um, you will find missing assignments, socks. There have been socks in backpacks, you know, um, a pair of craft scissors that a student thought, oh, I can use this for art class. And the parent's like, well, I didn't know that was there. So clean that backpack out. You will cut out a lot of missing assignments, teachers emailing you like, they didn't turn this project in and it's like growing in the backpack. So go ahead and do that. Start that now. It's super helpful. And in elementary, I know that a lot of elementaries have the practice of the classroom folder where homework goes in and things that need to get turned in. Um, go back in the folder on a different side. Keep that practice up. You know, elementary sometimes will supply a folder. In junior high, they don't. But get a bright colored folder, you know, something that will stand out that they know, okay, this is my folder for homework. This is my folder for permission slips. And get into the routine of utilizing that. And then a front door drop zone or a go box that everything that needs to go back to school the next day or things that need to be signed or whatever can be dropped there in case, you know, you did you might be busy one evening. Go ahead and, and start that practice so the students know, like, this is where all my stuff goes. Before I go to bed, I need to put this permission slip. I need to put my shoes for the day because I may have a practice or I'm trying out for theater so I can't forget my script that I've been practicing all night. Things like that. Um, setting expectations with your student. Communication with your student about what's going on. Do you expect them to have conversations, conversations with you about their plans they have that week at school or if they're taking their lunch or if they're going to be eating in the cafeteria, things like that. Get those things started now. Um, what are their expectations for their grades? I know you're going to have the same expectations that you had for them in elementary school. Um, and then expectations for their behavior. You know, sometimes... We, we do our best to raise our children well, but when they have that transition into junior high, they're kind of like, ooh, I have more responsibilities, so my behavior can change. And as a parent, you're probably like, no, I can't. But they sometimes need to be reminded, just like we remind them in classrooms and at school, you know, we walk to class, we don't run to class, or it's the expectation that they have their homework or have their ID on them at all times, which is a, a thing that they will be required to do at the junior high level is to be wearing their ID at all times. So that's, that's a big change. Um, increased responsibility. It's their responsibility to take their supplies to class. Um, drop off and pick up. It's their responsibility to get on the bus on their own when their bus number is called. It's their responsibility to be at the car rider line or to walk home or get their bike. Um, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to, you know, wave them when they get out of the car and say bye on the first day. And we always have parents that are super excited. They're like, yeah, okay, it's your turn now. We had them for the summer. So, but it's their responsibility to get where they need to go. There are people all over campus. We always have somebody in the hallway directing the kiddos, especially on the first day of school, school and especially with our sixth graders, because we want them to feel safe and secure. But they have to start taking responsibility of getting to class on time when they have seven or eight different classes. Um, utilizing their cell phone. That's a big thing. A lot of junior high classrooms will utilize technology within their class to, um, you know, do Quizlets or, or fun games. But the students have to be responsible about that because there are guidelines and responsible use things that we have in place. You can also start utilizing a cell phone if your student has one to put calendar invites in, set reminders. If they don't want to write in their planner, they need to get used to taking a picture of the assignments on the board and, you know, putting it in their phone as a calendar reminder. Oh, project due on Friday. Let me set a reminder so I know that I can take care of it. And one of the other big things, natural consequences. This is a, a really big adjustment. I'm going to tell you, stop the deliveries. Okay, I know it's going to be really hard for you as a parent, but sometimes, you know, we have to let the natural consequences happen for our kiddos of, you know, you forgot your homework. Okay, you're just going to have to turn it in late and you're going to start with a 70 or an 80 or whatever it is. Or if they forgot their lunch or forgot to get lunch money from you, we're not going to let them starve, okay? They can charge lunch a couple of times. We're not going to let them starve. But they've got to ha learn the responsibility of, of taking care of those things on their own. Things happen like 
you know, they end up with failing grades or detention or missing out on certain activities because they didn't turn in a permission slip. But once again, we're trying to teach them responsibility and get into the routine of taking care of things themselves. Because I don't think any parents want to go to their go to college with their kiddo. No, no one, not at all. I didn't think so. Okay, so but we're going to take good care of your kids. I mean, we know that it's a big transition. You have been at the elementary level since kinder. And, you know, now they're moving to a brand new school. But, you know, we, we love kids, and we know that it's going to be an adjustment for you. And counselors are always available to, to answer questions. Shoot an email, you know, to us. And, you know, best of luck to you all being first-time fifth-grade parents. Hi, good evening. Thanks again for coming out. Um, I'm going to close this out a little bit today. I'm going to try and be respectful of our time. And where's the clicker? So I'm going to speak with you guys a little bit about the characteristics of a successful junior high student. Um, we've touched on a lot of those things already. Um, we know that our goal as parents and as educators is to raise these little, little beings that come to us able to do absolutely nothing into successful, productive, happy members of society. Um, but kids don't magically wake up on their 18th birthday knowing how to adult right? That's a, it's a process. It's a, a set of skills that they have to learn. They have to make mistakes, and we have to learn to let go. And um, that process ideally needs to start around fifth grade, give or take fourth, fifth, sixth. E each kid is in that little developmental bubble. But the good thing, the good news is, is the kids in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, they're developmentally ready to start practicing adult skills. Um, their little prefrontal cortex, that's where we manage all of our adulting. Um, those are starting to grow and, and really fire off, and so they're ready to go, which is why they're rolling our eyes whenever we give our suggestions, right? And they're a little more resistant to the boundaries we put. That's because they're ready to start practicing adulting. And guys, we want them to practice adulting, right? Because that's where, that's making mistakes, that's where we make all of our learning, right? So... I bring all of that up to say because the characteristics of a successful junior high student, those are kids who are practicing adulting. Those are kids who are getting in there and trying these, ad and, and their parents are letting them. And that's sometimes hard. I've got a sixth grader. Um, I've also got a 10th grader. But um, it's hard when you're first letting them go and letting them make their own mistakes. But that's what it takes to, to raise successful, independent um, adults is we let them adult. One, um, a cup, and these kind of go hand in hand. A successful junior high student is going to be a problem solver and a decision maker. How many of us know that, you know, when we get to adulthood, we've got a lot of decisions and a lot of problems that we have to solve that are kind of complex, and the consequences of those decisions or, or problems um, are far reaching and kind of big. We don't want our kids to um, make their first decision when it's a big deal. We want them to practice when the problems are a little bit smaller. Now, your junior high student, your fifth grader, they're, they're, they think their problems are big, and to them they are. And that's great because we want them to feel the pressure of solving those problems. But how do we teach problem solving and decision making? It's really hard. It's, it really is hard because we have to let them make those decisions. We have to let them problem solve. Um, I'm going to use an example from my sixth grader. I asked her permission. Don't worry. But um, one example of that, for example, is she called me in a frantic mess one day. I forgot my ID. We're, I've got to have it. I'm going to get in trouble because, as they said, you have to wear your ID, right? And I said, wow, honey, I am so sorry. That is a problem because you might get in some trouble. What are you going to do about that? And you guys know what she said, right? The first thing a new problem solver is going to say is, well, can you bring it up to me? But we're going to stop the deliveries, right? We're not going to save her from forgetting her ID. There are solutions out there. And so this is where you ask for permission to offer some solutions. And you say, well, honey, I know that's, that's you might get in trouble. What do you think you're going to do? I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, would you like some suggestions? And, of course, I offered my daughter a few suggestions, and she didn't like any of them, and she went off with her own decision, and that's fine. She problem-solved it, not in a way that I would, but she practiced problem-solving. And so that's going to help build a problem-solver. Start doing that now while they're in fourth and fifth grade. They get to sixth grade, they've got a little bit of practice. Um, same thing with decisions. Decisions in sixth grade, fifth grade, fourth grade, they're smaller. Um, do I go to a football game with my friend? 
or do I study for the two tests that I have tomorrow? It's going to be okay. I know you're like, what do you mean? Of course she's going to study for her test, right? Well, depending on your student, and you guys know your, your kids, you're going to start letting them have a little more control over that because we know that um, sixth grade grades, they don't count towards college. They don't go on the transcript. Let them feel what it might feel like to fail that test because they chose to go to the football game. Because if they fail it now, it's uncomfortable. I don't like that. Next time I learned, okay, well, you know, maybe I'll make a better decision this time. You know your kid, but my point is start off small. Start with small problems. Start with the smaller decisions and gradually begin to turn that over to them. Because before long, guys, 16's coming and they're going to be driving. And how many of you know there's a lot of split-second decisions they need to make, right? So let's let them start practicing that now. Uh, successful junior high students are responsible and they're organized, and we've already spoke quite a bit about that. Um, but they know to do their homework, they know to turn it in, because why do it if you're not going to turn it in? Um, but how do we teach responsibility? She's already spoke about this, natural consequences. Um, it's really hard because we have our little babies and they're so helpless and defenseless and they can't do anything for their own. And then they gradually grow and they learn things. And, and it's real hard because we've always been there with them to protect them from consequences. But at this point in their life, for the smaller things, we need to go ahead and turn that over to them. If they forget their homework, I'm so sorry, what are you going to do about that? And just turn it back over to them, but resist the urge to save them from that lower grade in homework because that's where they're going to learn. Uh, another um, example from my daughter, she called a couple of months ago. Um, she would forgot her flute for a band, and they had a chair test. Oh, my gosh, Mom, I forgot my flute, I forgot my flute. Okay, honey, well, wow, don't you have that chair test today? Yeah, I do. Can you bring it up to me? Honey, I can't. I've got this meeting. I'm so sorry. Um, how are you going to solve this problem? And you just turn it back to them. And yeah, she did. She got second to last chair that day. Um, but it's okay because she um, was able to do another chair test a few weeks later and she got a little bit better. But she hasn't forgotten her flute since then. I say all that about natural consequences. We also want to teach them about grace, right? How many of you guys know that every now and then you want your boss to cut you some slack, right? And you had a bad day, whatever. So we want our kids to know that too. So you don't want to be just so dogmatic about the natural consequences. In my house, we limit it to one time a semester. I will save you from a natural consequence one time. You can use that in September when you forget your flute, when it really doesn't matter or the week before your big concert in December, and you really wanted to be first chair for that, so you want to save it for a time when it's really urgent. Just some ideas. A lot of these ideas are um, love and logic based. Uh, several of our campuses teach love and logic. Um, so if you want to know more about some of the love and logic um, ideas for creating um, or raising adults, um, check into that with your counselor. A uh, successful junior high student is attentive. In the classroom, I always teach my students, your, um, if your teacher says it more than once, it's important. Make sure you write it down. Um, if your teacher writes it on the board, it's important. You should write it down. So um, we teach our kids those things. Oh, announcements. Okay, you know how um, in Wednesday folders, they bring home all the announcements from PTA or Monday folders. Every school's a little different. But you get all the announcements from the school and the front office and the PTA, and this is picture day, and here's all... Yeah, they don't have a nice container like that at junior high, at least not at my kids' junior high. So the kids get their, their information from announcements. So what I teach my fifth graders is during announcements, have your planner out. Yes, you still need to use a planner when you get to junior high. And write down anything that's pertinent to you. You're in the pep squad, write down when your pep squad um, practices or whatever it is that's relevant to you during announcements, go ahead and write that down. Pay attention because you're going to be held responsible for it. Um, and there's not going to be notes that go home necessarily. Um, a successful junior high student is independent. Now, independent, that's another life skill, right? That's another adulting skill that they need to practice. It's not something we can just say, oh, yeah, you're free. Now go. Um, we have to gradually allow them to have more independence. One thing I encourage you guys to do is let your children advocate for themselves. Um, I know that whenever, for example, I have a concern um, at my job or whatever, I go to my boss. I don't call my mom and have my mom call my boss. That would be a little career limiting, right? So 
Um, we need to gradually teach our children those self-advocacy skills. So in third grade, it's probably normal for if you're looking over your child's math test and they missed three, but you did the math and they actually got it right. Maybe the teacher was sleeping when she was grading, I don't know, but my kid needs credit for this. In third grade, it's common for a parent to go ahead and shoot an email to a teacher, hey, take a look at this, da 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 da, -da. End of fourth grade, beginning of fifth grade, we like for our parents to kind of back off just a little bit and say, wow, yeah, you did get those right. What do you think you should do about that? And let them problem solve and come up with, well, I need to tell my teacher. Some kids are going to be nervous about that. I don't want to be disrespectful. Coach them through that. Go ahead and let them know. It's okay. They're not going to think you're disrespectful. It's all in the delivery. You just say, hey, can you take another look at this? Blah, 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 blah. But coach them. When they're maybe in fourth and fifth grade, follow up with an email with the teacher. Hey, Susie's going to come to you today. She's going to talk to you about this. Um, and then let the kiddo handle it. But by sixth grade, that student needs to be able to go to their math teacher and say, hey, I think I got these three right. Can you take another look? They need to be able to say, I can't see right here. Um, can I move to another chair? Um, they need to be able to say, this is not a good seat choice for me because that's my best friend. So they need to start learning how to advocate for themselves now, practicing that now in fifth grade with, of course, your support. I need to hurry. Am I out of time? I can wrap that up. Okay, um, communicator. A successful junior high student is a good communicator. Um, they don't always get it right, but they're trying. With their peers, they're resisting the urge to gossip. They're not spreading rumors. Just because they hear something doesn't mean they need to go and tell other people. With their teachers, they also communicate when they don't understand something, when they're confused, when they need extra help, when they'd like to retake a test. Again, the idea here with communication is it falls more and more on the student and less and less on the parent. Because again, remember, we're raising adults, right? And we want them to be able to do that for themselves. Finally, resourceful with technology. They have already spoken about the Home Access Center. Great tool. Again, gradually teach your children to take over monitoring their own grades. Katie Cloud. All of your students can access Katie Cloud with their login anywhere that they have internet access. On Katie Cloud are going to be their online textbooks. It's also where they're going to access Canvas. Super important Canvas. There's, um, that's where teachers post assignments. There'll be discussions on there sometimes that they're required to participate in. Um, what else is on there? Oh, they'll do reviews on there, all kinds of stuff. So fifth graders, go ahead and start getting used to what, what Canvas has to offer. Finally, um, junior highs often use other apps. Um, I know my, some of my daughter's teachers send out Remind 101. I have my daughter get her Remind 101 reminders. I get them too, but I don't use it to necessarily nag her. Like I'll, I got a, um, a Remind on Tuesday that she has a quiz tomorrow. Review on Canvas. I resist the urge, because I want my daughter to get good grades, to go to Canvas, download, or print off the review, give it to her, and say, hey, you have a quiz on Thursday. I'm waiting to see if she, she's in cheer practice right now. I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go pick her up. We'll see if she's studied. I don't know if she has or not. I'll check in on her today, but hopefully she has. But you're, each kid's different. You may have a child that you might need to remind a little bit more. But these are just some ideas about making our kids more independent. Thank you for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Christy Maker. Thank you, panel, for a wonderful presentation. I think that you have all provided us some excellent information. Um, we do have quite a few questions that we've gotten here, and some of them are, um, are going to be easily answered. However, others will take a little bit more time, a little more research to get you the accurate information uh, across the board, but we will do our best. Um, first, I will begin with a comment uh, that, that one of our parents has put forward. Uh, you might want to mention that there is an awesome, quote, uh, KDISD pre-AP information class to help parents decide on the level for their students. Um, they typically hold those at the, uh, at the educational support complex uh, near the Merrill Center, by the Merrill Center. Um, and so you will find information for that online and your campus will be providing information as well. Um, the question was asked, what is pre-AP? 
Um, the academic level courses are the standard courses that, um, that students are placed in. However, pre-AP is a more rigorous, advanced academic curriculum, and it does prepare students for the purposes to prepare them for taking advanced placement courses as they enter high school. And advanced placement courses are college board, they're, um, they're nationally normed courses, and um, it's a way for students to earn college credit. Another important thing to note about the difference between pre-AP and academic is academic courses are, when it comes to earning high school credit, uh, academic level courses are 4.0 grading scale. Um, the pre-AP courses are on a 5.0 grad grading scale because they are more rigorous, they are a bit more challenging uh, for our students. And uh, that said, if you would like to stick around for our next session that begins at 7.15 promptly, uh, we will have a lot more information on pre-AP at that time. Um, and then the other, the other questions um, that have come out, uh, we will need to look further into uh, to make sure that we are providing accurate information on what the policies are for, um, for taking home graded quizzes and tests. Thank you again for coming out, and, uh, and again, please do look in about a week to see uh, this information posted online along with the presentation.